This conference will now be recorded. Um, within Network Rails Engineering Function, but obviously will be uh, shortly be called the Technical Authority as we move into the new organisation. So I got involved with New York Flight Crossing quite some years ago, um, and obviously it was relayed last August um, due to uh, some requirements from um, problems with the actual timbers, really, in, in terms of what the reason behind the actual renewal was, and the, the ballast itself was getting to the point where it was actually um, basically disintegrating the actual bearers themselves. So quite a lot of background as to why I was involved in flat, New York Flat Crossing quite a few years ago, which I'll go through on this. Um, and there's some people that were involved in the project. So Steve Barney's on the call, I think, and Patrick Charles and Gunter Kula from Sekisui. So there's probably quite a few people that may be able to answer some of the questions you might have if I'm not able to when we get to the end of this. So without further ado, we'll just move further on. So this presentation was really something that was being done at the Manchester PDOI meeting last year, uh, which I did with um, Mark Smith, who was the project um, engineer who installed the actual crossing, and Monib Saklan, who's one of the um, LME, as it was, project engineers from IP. So New York Flat Crossing itself, it's obviously got a few different terms that people know it or buy, so New York Star, New York Diamond, etc. Um, but basically, it's the link between uh, the East Coast Main Line from King's Cross up to uh, York, Doncaster area, and then it's crossed by the New York to Lincoln Line, which obviously is why the actual crossing is in its uh, current location. So it's obviously quite a complicated looking layout. It's got various um, areas within the, the actual castings themselves, which are eight double star crossings which obviously is, is quite unique. So this junction is the only one of its type in our infrastructure, our network rails infrastructure. And so to my knowledge, the only other one that's very similar to this is in Limerick in, uh, in Southern Ireland. And they've only got um, one track crossing two tracks. So that's the only one that's around in the rest of Europe, as far as we know, that looks anything like this. So it's a one in 44, so it's a 44.6 angle crossing. So it's quite uh, unique in that style um, and obviously quite uh, difficult um, to maintain uh, and clearly is a challenge for maintenance to keep it up to um, a good standard. So Steve Viley is on the call, I think he put a lot of, sort of these slides together which was used on the previous um, mentioned Peter White conference in Manchester. So looking at the history of, of uh, Newark itself, clearly going back quite some time now, 1960s, looking at how it was perhaps um, installed when it was relayed at that point. Uh, and clearly, as, as you can see there, well, it obviously needed to have some joints within the actual bears themselves. And clearly, it's not um, something that's new, considering where we are with bearer joints at the moment in terms of our current s and layouts. So then 1972, it obviously was relayed again with some packing from JARA and way beams, etc., to obviously keep it going again. Then uh, May 1986, again, obviously a little bit more modern in terms of machinery that's been used. And then obviously between 86 and 88, the East Coast Main Line was electrified in the area that this crossing actually exists. So quite a little change again in that sense. And the last renewal before this was done last year, it was in 2003. So it's a cycle of around about 15 to 20 years about how quickly um, the renewal keeps coming around. Well, clearly it's really on condition because it's a very difficult new junction to actually get access to, to relay because it's quite disruptive in terms of it will actually stop the East Coast Main Line from uh, running. Um, clearly in this case, in August 2003, it was relayed using a very, um, one of the biggest um, road cranes in the country to actually be able to lift it in place using a single lift with that crane in particular. But in the meantime, I got involved in 2015 looking at crossings that were actually causing a lot of problems due to a lot of issues with fasteners, which we'll talk about later. Um, but obviously that's been something that I've been involved in since probably 2014 onwards, where we started looking at the crossing issues and then moving it further forward towards where we are now, where the renewal was coming out last year. So in other words, we've obviously got a renewal that's been basically carried out every 15 to 20 years. 
it's got very issues with track quality over the uh, last few year, um, renewal periods where actually it's been in a very poor band even after it's been renewed, renewed in recent times. It's been difficult due to the actual geometry of the, the layout itself and a bit of the construction of how it's actually had to be um, put together. Ballast is obviously was shot underneath the sleepers so in the bearers were actually on ballast that was life expired and that was one of the other issues that was highlighted when the uh, track bed investigation was carried out. The double star crossings are on a, an MST, so a mounted scheduled task, so actually looking at grinding them every eight weeks or looking at seeing where grinding perhaps needs to be done to keep the crossing in decent condition, which is obviously quite a, a task with a number of um, noses on each of those crossings, so it's about 32 noses all together. Timbers themselves were causing a lot of problems um, because of the, uh, the actual wood itself, which is a green heart wood that was used in the 2003 renewal. And they were getting to the point where one or two had got some damage and they were starting degrading quite badly. And there had been a um, temporary speed restriction, emergency speed restriction put on um, in 2015 because of the actual condition of crossing. Which We'll talk about the fastening system of that, which was the, uh, the reason for the speed, um, but we'll go through that shortly. Um, so specification of how we actually looked at this. Um, obviously, CP6 was the first, uh, first year for CP6 where it was actually planned to carry out. So in other words, in, in, the way things worked out, obviously they uh, got the Light flight renewal request in February 2017. This is IP track, um, and obviously looking at further options potentially where timber was not necessarily the right way to go forward because of perhaps some procurement issues. In November, um, there was a 2017 FFU, so fiber foam reinforced urethane, was actually given product acceptance for longitudinal timber, so in other words, on bridge beams. So, this is sort of an area where this was. Um, a consideration to look at alternatives for replacing the timber. So in December 2017, we're looking at maybe possibility of looking at this as an option for new. Um, obviously, there was a bit of a, a problem in that the actual FFU bearers that were actually installed on probably about five sites in mainly the southeast area on longitudinal timbers, bridge timbers, were really on a trial certificate, so actually moving it to allow us to then you look at something from complexity of newer was, was a bit of a question mark. Um, so initially there was a conversation about how this could actually be um, taken forward and looking at FU as a material for this, but obviously the history of Network Rail's um, experience with FFU was a bit um, uh, very infantile in terms of years that we've had this uh, particular material in track, even on longitudinal bridge beams, it was about four to five years. So we weren't quite sure about whether that was going to give us the actual longevity that uh, hopefully this was needed for this particular layout. But in April, I, I found out about the actual renewal of New York flight crossing in probably February, March time of 2018. So it'd be, work had been going on for a little while before I uh, understood that this was happening. But the problem I actually got when I found out was it was really looking to be a light, light renewal. Well, as you'll come, we'll come on to in a minute or two, there's a lot of reasons why I wasn't happy that it was going for a light, a light renewal because of issues that were resolved by uh, changing the actual crossing in 2015. So we needed to look at it again. So ultimately, um, I had a chat with the head of track about looking to see if we can actually develop a system for Newark, looking at using the FFU. Um, and I got agreement with that, and then I actually went to the land track in um, l &E is the way, and, and basically said, look, this is an option we can do because of the, some issues, obviously, with the potential supply of the actual types of timber that were required for the actual bearers, which again, we'll explain a little bit further as we get into the presentation. So in May 2018, Secretary Suri were invited to basically give a presentation about the actual use of the, the FFU technology and material and, and where it actually fit in with perhaps uh, being a material we can use for Newark's replacement 
So in July of 2018, Progress Rail um, basically were given the actual contract to build the whole layout, including sourcing the FFU bearers, which again we'll talk about a little bit further. So as it said before, the initial contract was looking at um, IP to develop a way of actually relaying your know, flat crossing in a like for like basis on the actual 2003 design. So looking at re replacing the timber matrix that the bearers were as they were in, um, installed in 2003. But in between there, like I said earlier on in 2014, I got involved in um, New York flat crossing quite heavily in terms of the crossing. So the reason why I got involved was obviously this is one of the big problems. They had fastening system where the screws were actually installed from the 2003 renewal at an angle of one in 20. But by 2014, about 45% of the screws had failed across the whole of the, uh, the, the junction, which was quite a problem. And it, that was one of the reasons why the speed went on. But as you can see, the 1 in 20 angle was um, a way of trying to actually pin the crossings down and stop them from moving around through the lateral movement as um, trains specifically went up the East Coast Main Line because of the, the speed involved in that. And the Lincoln and Newark Line, which had more mainly heavy freight, um, causing quite some issues with lateral movement. But as you can see on the top of the picture there, you've got two holes there that have got the um, nylon ferrules in there. And the problem that was occurring over the years between 2003 and perhaps 2010, where things started to deteriorate, was those ferrules were starting to wear. But nobody knew that they were wearing because you couldn't see them, obviously, when the screws were installed. You're not actually seeing the fact that there's a ferrule in there and if it's broken, or if it's being worn. So a lot of the ferrules actually were broken or that had actually worn to the point where they weren't effective anymore. So it was allowing more lateral movement between the actual casting hole and the screw shank itself. So lots of lateral movement was happening and hence that's why the number of screws were breaking. So initially I got involved by certain engineers from l &E were looking to try and find some method to actually hold the crossings down to stop them from actually needing to replace them in um, time before the actual renewal came around. So they're hoping to try and keep this going until the renewal is actually um, due to actually be um, implemented. But unfortunately this didn't um, work very well. It wasn't necessarily going to, in the first place when I looked at trying to get exceptions for this um, clamping method to be installed um, and obviously it only lasted a, a few months before things started falling apart again unfortunately. So the actual solution we came across was looking at actually redesigning the foot of this crossing so we made it into a vertical um, screw again with a this time instead of using a nylon ferrule we used a, a eccentric steel top hat ferrule which was used on longitudinal bridge streams. So it was um, a way of actually allowing the holes to be drilled into the bearers. It didn't have to be central within the actual hole in the castings, um, but we could move the ferrule around to actually mate up with the actual position of the, the center of the hole for the, um, the, the drilling into the bear itself. So we could actually fasten everything and get it tight. And it worked quite well in that up until the renewal itself, I think the actual fastening system was intact. So it had been in, in track for about four, four and a half years and no other screw failures been reported during that time. So the change in design actually had the desired effect. So this is just a, a picture of what the design looked like. So on the left-hand side, the old crossing fastening arrangement, that was where we had the actual one in 20 angled screws that were going through the casting foot and that was where the problems occurred when our ferrule actually started wearing clearly allowing a lot more lateral movement to occur than was um, desirable and hence the actual screws were um, getting them moved around a little bit and um, lateral movement on those as well of course them to fracture and they couldn't repair them because basically they couldn't drill out those screws so the reason behind that was that the green heart timber is very very dense and it was not very easy to actually take out a damaged screw and put it back in again. But clearly, lots of damaged screws in the, in the actual crossing itself was one thing. You have to take the crossing off to actually be able to drill out the actual screw. 
which was uh, obviously a problem itself. But trying to actually then put the screw back in there was obviously uh, impossible as well because the old screw was still actually in the uh, timber. So trying to actually repair it in any way whatsoever was not a problem that could be um, resolved because you couldn't drill out the screw, you couldn't drill out the actual core of the um, the old screw into in the timber and take that out and try and replace it. It was just um, a nightmare. So there was a big problem to resolve. Hence, we redesigned the crossing foot in 2015 with this arrangement. So it's got a vertical screw. It didn't necessarily mean we'd actually change the casting, particularly in terms of the diameter of the hole that the casting had due to mold issues. Uh, but we put this eccentric ferrule in there. So it added a little bit more in terms of componentry that the passing system had, but it tightened everything up in the terms of wherever the actual hole was drilled in terms of the circumference of the hole in the casting, we could mate up the actual um, contact between the casting itself and the eccentric ferrule, which allowed everything to be tight instead of um, allowing lateral movement to destroy things and then break the actual screw. But in the redesign itself for the re renewal in 2019, we looked at how we could actually tighten everything up by actually reducing the actual hole in the casting of the screw, uh, the actual casting of the foot of the, um, the crossing, taking out the actual requirement for the eccentric ferrule. So we got rid of the ferrule completely. Um, we have now a shank, um, which is actually about the same size as the, um, the actual, Go back to the actual um, slide I was looking for. Sorry, I seem to move forward somehow. Um, yeah, it just actually tightened everything up without actually the need for that extra component. So we took out the eccentric ferrule to simplify the actual uh, different number of components that were required for the SAS system. So that's worked out very well as well. So looking at renewal changes that we actually put into the actual next iteration so the current um, layout is installed now so we look uh, we've now got composite bearers that's a few which we'll go through in a bit more detail in a minute in lieu of the green heart timber track bed design was actually um, looked at very closely and the bespoke design was made by the track bed team we looked at hp rail to look at um, where we actually ran off the actual um, cast crossing so we had envisaged we'd have um, edh'd crossings in this terms because the uh, ones that were actually installed in 2015 were EDH for the first time but there was a problem with uh, how that worked out hence we actually went for HB rail because the hardness of the HB rail would be very similar to an EDH um, crossing surface hardness. SGI and base plates with Pandora lead plus clips because at the time when the renewal was done in 2003 it was still using um, Grey iron, which is quite a, a weaker cast iron, so it didn't have the high tolo clips, which um, this obviously offered. Concrete bearers uh, with undersleeper pads. Um, so we actually have undersleeper pads on the actual FFU bearers as well, which adds to um, some hopefully longevity of the, the ballast itself, which we again will go through in a bit more detail shortly. We looked at using Huddersfield University, who've done a lot of work with Network Rail at um, looking at crossing profiles to optimize what crossing profile would look like. So we, we weren't guaranteeing that this was going to be a um, definite answer that would give us some definite um, benefits because as you could probably imagine, you've got two routes crossing each other at different angles. So if you change the profile of one route, you, you might affect or to the detriment of the other route. And basically that's what we found from the results that Huddersfield looked at was the modeling they came out with different scenarios of how you could actually improve the um, surface profile of each route. But the problem was that obviously, as I just mentioned, we would actually improve one at the cost of another. So trying to actually change them was going to be a bit of a lottery. So eventually we really basically stayed with the same um, profile that we've got currently, enhanced it very slightly, really down to the fact we didn't want to um, basically disadvantage either route in terms of what performance you might get out of the crossing. So that study was done, but again, as we said, we set out with uh, a health warning that this might not actually achieve any benefits at all, but it actually would prove one way or the other where the profile we had was actually the best that we could actually uh, 
used as a compromise. And the crossing, they were pre-drilled for continuity bonding, so it's something else that which wasn't done in previous uh, renewals. So, okay, quickly moving on to why are we actually moving to composite? Well, obviously there is a clause within uh, 2102 um, looking at potentially um, or artificial composite alternatives for, for longitudinal timbers. So obviously New York's not quite a longitudinal timber bridge, but clearly it's got that sort of similarity there. However, one of the problems we came across, which was a real um, showstopper really, was that the actual source of green heart timber was, was constrained in two ways. One, we wanted a, a length of timber, which was a lot longer than was available. So they could only actually provide up to six meters. And obviously with the supply actually being based in Cameroon, there's a lot of civil unrest in the country at the time. And I think still is going on. So trying to get anything out of the, uh, the country that would actually meet the lead times we needed for a renewal was not only possible. The lead time was going to be probably one to two years. So we needed an alternative and one that could actually be sustainable, but clearly make sure we actually met the requirements of the length of timber bearer we needed um, compared to what was available. So that's why we went for FFU. So there's obviously this, um, I already had product exceptions for long children timber bridge beams. So we had to actually look at how we could actually change that and take it forward as a trial certificate for looking at designing New York beams and the matrix that needed to be built on that. So a little bit of background now about what FFU actually is. So it's the acronym is Fiber Reinforced Foam Urethane. Um, this is some slides from Secusu themselves. So it's looking at how the FFU is, is actually manufactured. And it's obviously using this pultrusion process. So instead of um, actually being pushed through, it's pulled through as the name suggests. It's made of glass fiber, which obviously impregnated with uh, some sort of resin, polyurethane, and it's um, hardened obviously at um, an elevated temperature to cure. So one of the problems we had when it comes to moving away from the uh, actual FFU itself is how we actually um, implement this. Because looking at something that's introduced as a new material and it's novel is quite a problem when it comes to CSM. So anybody who's not familiar with CSM, it's a common safety method. So for those that are a bit um, more mature, if you like, um, it used to be the yellow book in the previous um, sort of few, couple of decades ago. But CSM itself needs um, to be considered on every project um, that IP do. And obviously, because we're from the uh, FMSTE, we were looking at how CSM would actually be significant or not when it comes to introducing an FFU material, which is quite unique. So what, one reason that the NRAP reclassify the project to CSM significant is I have to put enough application from the product point of view to assess whether it's novel or introducing some new material that actually would potentially um, not incorporate risk as such, but actually change the benefits and the actual performance of the actual bearers. So introducing FFU was considered by NRAP as, uh, as I actually uh, applied uh, as a significant change. So hence we had to go through the CSM process. So the problem we had was that STE had actually, and myself had actually put it in as a CSM significant, but the IP project side of things was saying, well, actually it's a light for light renewal in terms of the, the layout's not changing. So actually it's not um, changing the configuration of what the angle of the rate New York, um, New York flat crossing is going to be. So it's really light for light from their point of view. So it was a little bit of a, a, a um, conflict, if you like, in terms of who actually was saying one, one thing, IP saying it was another. So we had to go down the road of actually using the uh, that sort of significant um, justification through NRAP and they agreed with, uh, with my findings that actually it's introducing a novel product, so we need to go through the full CSM process. So I led the process for the CSM and we had Ricardo Ray, who was the uh, assessment body, independent assessment body to do the CSM assessment for us. Second, so we, we needed design approval for the um, layout itself before December 
2018. So the timelines meant we had to get the order to secretary before then, so that it would actually mean the lead time could be met. So we looked at um, getting the RPWs created through having them for the bearers in particular. In this case, we had some also done for the crossing layout itself, which um, was done by Progress Rail, but um, obviously linked in terms of uh, RF Budweiser with STE. And we need it obviously for the exceptions for this bespoke arrangement. And the other problem was the size of the bearers, which will, again, we'll come on in a minute to uh, what those problems entail. So in Sekisui's um, factory in Japan, which is where the FBU bearers were, would normally, for normal children, timber bear, bearer replacements come from, they can do um, seven metre lengths. That's the factory's um, standard length, but obviously they can go up to 9.4 metres, and that's the, the actual maximum length they can produce in the factory. So it's only produced in Japan, so there's obviously shipping limitations because of the um, use of any shipping containers only means you can actually put up to a length of 10 meters. Unfortunately, we needed 16, so a little bit of a conundrum there. So we couldn't actually make them in Japan anyway because the factory couldn't actually um, show anything out more than 9.4 meters. So how on earth were we going to sort this out? So what we actually came across was we needed some way of actually manufacturing these in the UK. So we approached Progress Rail with uh, Sakasui, who were obviously given the contract to actually make the layout, um, and basically asked them to um, consider making the actual bearers, so manufacturing them in one of their um, facilities with the um, assistance of Sakasui engineers. Um, but obviously you'd look at Progress Rail and they'd probably say, oh, well, a second, we make crossings, we make switches, we don't do bearers. So why on earth would we actually look at this in terms of making it much more difficult for us to actually take the risk on, etc., and build these? Anyway, after a lot of conversations with the um, Sekisui, ourselves, Progress Rail, and obviously the commercial aspects of, of route services, supplying the layout, uh, and obviously commercial aspects from Progress Rail's point of view, they agreed to actually take the uh, challenge and actually build these. So the agreement was that the all the materials uh, would be, um, where possible, pre-assembled um, in Japan, where there, there was possibilities of actually manufacturing and assembling certain aspects of the required layout. But the rest of it would be shipped over in kit form for um, Progress Rail staff to actually manufacture the beans. So what you're seeing here at the moment, if the actual um, areas that are actually in pink they're ones that were actually pre-assembled and supplied from Sekisui as a, um, a finished item. But the longer beams, which are 16 metres in length, were in the actual more brown shaded, were actually manufactured by Progress Red using the information that um, engineers from Sekisui provided and the expertise they um, provided as far as some um, supervising um, at a facility in, in, Lincoln, uh, in Ilkeston, Lincolnshire. So this is one of the um, drawings that actually was done by Secretary and it's now part of a row, uh, an RAPW. So looking at how the actual uh, bearers need to be constructed and obviously then needs to be fastened together to create the right matrix layout for New York flat crossing. So as I said before earlier, as part of the solution, we looked at um, obviously the bigger picture was what track bed design was needed. So it's ballasted. Um, we wanted to make sure we could reduce ballast settlement because of the problems that have developed since 2003's last renewal. Um, the investigation looked at obviously looking at um, how actually this needs to be done. Um, and the results really looked at basically saying that we've got protract policy because there's high dynamic forces. So if you think about the actual forces on eight crossing noses on each rail as the wheels of a HST go through the actual layout. You can imagine it's uh, getting a lot of dynamic forces that are going to cause a lot of ballast attrition. Underneath the track, the 2003 renewal had geocells that were actually um, installed and they were actually still found to be in good condition. So they were going to be kept 
um, basically they were going to put some more uh, geo cells on top of the current um, layout from 2003 in terms of um, extending the geo cells uh, and obviously adding one on top of the one that currently exists or did at the time. Looking at ballast degradation analysis in terms of looking at whether we actually used FFU or the current bearers which were made out of timber, there was quite a lot of work done in assessing how much effect the FFU would have in terms of um, past degradation in settlement, um, and including under sleeper pads, or under bearer pads in this case, on the actual uh, long bearers that the layout has got. So you can see on the actual graphs there, there's quite a significant benefit predicted by using FFU A on its own. But clearly, if you then combine that with under sleeper pads, the benefit increases quite considerably. And then if it was doubly compacted, as part of the uh, the build, then it adds a, a, many, uh, a benefit again to try and reduce the actual settlement over a uh, predicted 30 years. But clearly, that's uh, just a prediction at the minute, but that was what we um, was modelled by the track and investigation team, and it clearly looks very, very uh, appealing in terms of the actual um, performance improvements. So this is the option that was chosen. This is the um, basic design of how the layout would be put in and, and obviously the transition there between the um, FFU and the concrete sleepers with the sleeper pads going into the actual um, current tracks. This is just a, a quick overview of where the GSLs would actually be installed in terms of how it looks now, in terms of what's been installed um, in August 2019. So quickly moving on to how we um, manufactured the layout itself. So this is where I was responsible basically for making sure that this layout was designed for the FFU bearers in the correct way. We got the drawings right, we got the material to progress rail, and then we obviously were able to um, manufacture the crossings, do slightly modify some of the uh, ironwork to hopefully improve make some incremental improvements for performance when it's in track. So route services placed the contract with uh, Progress Rail to supply the double star crossings, which is basically something that has been supplied by the Progress Rail for since the layout um, was last renewed and before then. So they've got the castings and molds for the double star crossing. We were going to have them EDH'd. That was the initial starting point because of what we'd done in 2015. Then Progress Rail basically were um, to get around the procurement system, really, just to give you a bit of background. It was a case that if we actually said to um, route services, right, we need to go to Secretary and buy these actual um, bearers and then actually supply them to Progress Rail. Because of the cost involved with that, it go, went over the OJU limit, which is the um, official journal of the European Union, which means that if you are going to actually pay over £320,000 for a particular item, it has to go out to the OGU process, which is basically uh, letting anybody actually look at what the requirement is and then offer a solution in terms of what um, alternatives might be out there. But unfortunately, that process takes about 12 months. We clearly didn't have that time. So the only way we could get around that was actually to make sure that route services could vary the contract with Progress Rail and having had the discussion, as we mentioned earlier, about them actually manufacturing the, the bearers to actually still get them to subcontract to Sekisuri directly and get the actual bearers manufactured and supplied through the um, manufacturing of them in the UK, as we uh, explained earlier. So that was another area where we had to be a little bit innovative to try and make sure we didn't get caught up with contract issues. Um, obviously, look at how the actual FFU material can be worked. So we had a meeting at the Ilkeston facility that, where the bearers were built. So maintenance could come along and IP looked at how the actual FFU can be um, used. In other words, can we cut it? How is it drilled? What potential issues might there be for maintenance when it comes to looking at this in the future if they have to do some work on it? So it was looking at the actual functionality and how we actually demonstrate that the actual FFU material is, is very similar in terms of timber um, characteristics in, in real terms. 
So it wasn't that difficult to actually see that they could actually um, maintain it if necessary. Uh, obviously, and assemble a concrete uh, complete layout at Burgess Trails Yard, deliver it to side site and reassemble it with uh, systems for the actual Central Rail Systems Alliance and build all external panels that needed to actually put up to the um, the layout itself. So adjustments to each panel and any slave panels that we needed for the uh, renewal itself. And obviously we did this work with Huddersfield University to understand whether we can actually improve the rail, wheel, rail interface. So this is um, various pictures that were actually taken during the build of the bears in the yard at Ilkeston. So on the top left hand side, that is what was supplied to Progress Rail. So this is sheets of FFU, about 30 millimeters thick, and they had to build them up to actually uh, create a long 16 meter beam that was needed for each of the individual um, eight beams that are joined together to create the matrix. So on the bottom left, you can see how that was actually done. So the, the clamps are there to actually um, make sure the laminated laminate structures constructed is then clamped together to create the, that bond and then obviously left to cure for a specified time and then it's actually created the, um, the required shape and then obviously as you can see on the center is how the beams are actually assembled and then on the top right it's um, the fully assembled layout as it was initially as its first um, first build. Then obviously the next stage was to um, everything was painted brown. That's just the standard colour that was used as far as uh, what secretary supply. Obviously it tries to make it look a little bit like um, uh, the timber bearers that are in um, in track around the world to try and make it blend in a little bit better on the on the infrastructure instead of being a, a cream colour. But here you're seeing um, underneath the actual crossings there's a steel plate which is um, as you can see there you can just see the rusted sort of sections there underneath the pad. Each crossing then has a pad on it, underneath it, sorry, and then the crossings actually installed on top of that. Um, and obviously then all the other ancillary parts from the actual joint, etc., were um, put together as part of the build that's actually was completed inside the um, facility that uh, Project Trail have got in Ilkeston. So there it is, that was the um, fully assembled that were a New York flat crossing layout inside uh, a nice huge um, facility in Ilkeston to uh, make sure that actually it all worked and it fitted. But clearly that looks, looks great, but you can't actually lift that out of the uh, facility in Ilkeston and just put it on the back of the truck and take it out to um, Beeston to be taken to site. So it had to be disassembled again. So lots of areas where we uh, couldn't complete the assembly effectively in terms of fastening all the beams together, um, which is where we've got underneath the crossings, there's lots of areas where there's four bolts that are actually fastening each of the joints together to where they overlap. So as you can see on the actual um, bearers there, you've got holes in various places that are, um, um, are there at the moment without any particular fastening system in there at the moment. The reason why those holes are there, we actually consulted with the secretary engineers. So those holes really manage, uh, basically mirror the holes that were actually used in the bolt where bolt positions were on the current um, Greenheart timber layout. So that meant that we were talking about whether we felt there was a risk of potentially um, not means the, the bearer matrix in terms of the actual laminate structure not being necessarily uh, fully understood in terms of its performance in longevity terms to actually say well okay let's go for belt and braces and if we actually bolt it all together as well then we've actually got a bit more um, confidence that we've got two ways of actually making sure that this system isn't actually um, going to start deteriorating in track in the future. A the laminate structure is very very strong but B we've got the bolts in place also as a sort of a, a back backup system to hold everything together. So we had to then dismantle everything and take it down to Beeston to be loaded onto the um, tilting wagons to take it to site. But obviously the, one of the problems we didn't know um, at the time was what the bending moments we were actually putting on the actual beams when you lifted them. 
So clearly we have to be very careful about how we lifted them. What um, we looked at obviously in this case was looking at how you strap them to make sure that we weren't actually going to put any strain on the actual bearers themselves to make sure we didn't damage them. Because clearly if we damaged any of the beams before we got to the site, or even during the um, dismantling and reassembling process, we were going to be in real bother because we only had one of each beam. We had a bit of spare material to make a spare one if needed, but clearly that was going to add a lot more time to the build and maybe it put it at risk as whether we actually we would actually make the renewal date. So clearly we need to consider how this was done. One thing that was a problem in terms of looking at this lift itself, you've got two beams together. So the T pieces at the end are clearly holding those two beams apart, but because of the way the straps have gone around the beams, you're clearly at risk of squeezing the whole um, structure together, the two beams, which might actually cause some damage. So a T-piece was a bit built out of some timber to actually use as a spacer to sit on top of the, um, the beams as they were lifted to make sure that they weren't squeezed together and cause the actual structures to, to be damaged and cause us problems dimensionally when it came to re uh, assembling it. So part of the other parts of the build, there were some slave um, panels that were needed to be built. And this is one of them on the left hand side, as you can see, it's got three sleeper heights joined together to make sure that the, um, the hole where the actual um, layout was taken out, taken out of and then relayed to actually with ballast to, to build it up to a certain level to allow the new uh, bearers to go in with the, um, the crossings on top. They had to have some deep slave panels put in to make sure it could mate with the actual adjacent panels. You can see how that actually means that it's got a design bespoke for this particular need and just a, as a temporary panel which was used in the, in the renewal, which we'll probably see a picture of later on. And obviously, as uh, we mentioned before, there's lots of um, adjustment switches either side of, of each of the where, um, tracks going in and out of the crossing. So the crossing clearly can't be stressed because it's um, it's just such a lump, it would be actually nigh impossible to keep it in, in a stressed state. So every single track has got some adjustment switches on it as it goes to and from the actual work that we have. So this was the development plan that IP put together as to how they were going to um, carry out the renewal. So obviously they were trying to do as much as possible to keep traffic running where possible, but clearly taking a big lump out of the East Coast mainline, it wasn't going to be easy. Um, looking at what was actually required from a build area, so taking um, the layout from Ilkeston to site and then rebuilding re, um, re it was obviously something that we need to have a build area on site, which was clearly going to be a challenge, as we'll see in a minute. Um, and there was a choice of using a Kirov cranes or mobile cranes. So Kirov cranes were chosen, so two were actually used to, to lift the layout. But obviously the, the advantage of that was the OLE didn't need to be taken down. Um, and obviously with a limited space, the Kirovs didn't need to be on land um, where space was limited. They could obviously lift on the track. Um, obviously there's a bit of resilience there if the weather would have had high winds, whereas if you had a, a very large road crane, that would be limited if high winds were a problem. But um, it could be a risk that would mean the layout wouldn't be installed when it was, uh, when it was uh, going to be planned in August. Um, obviously, the contingency option, it was a capability that if one of the cranes went down, that one crane could um, actually lift the layout. It was getting close to its capacity, but it still had the capability. So that was a possibility that um, was um, covered as far as the risks there. So removal of the old flat crossing, so looking at saving all the casts that were in there because they were only from 2015, they're still in very reasonable condition. So they've been saved for maintenance and now are um, at Whitemore where they've been stored, the majority of them. Uh, and obviously looking at temporary trap panels, which we talked about before, what was required for um, allowing the actual layout to be installed and allowing traffic to move up and down in the um, installation process. Differences between the heights and the plane line and the crossing area. That's why the slave panels were, were made the height they were. Um, and obviously you need to slave rails to suit that. And obviously as part of that, you need to have some temporary joints and, and how they need to be um, worked, especially where we've got check rails that are looking at um, 
continuously cleaning um, in and out of the natural light itself. And obviously bonding, which we mentioned a bit earlier on. And looking at how we could, they could actually stage um, the handback on Newark cord. So there is a cord on one of the actual lines that's going from Newark and it goes onto the East Coast Main Line. So that's just a, a quick lifting plan of how the actual removal of the old layout was, was actually planned, how the cutting points were actually um, identified, etc. And the panels themselves, so the order of, of service, if you can like, is how the panels were going to be used. Uh, and obviously, panel four and one were both slate panels, which needed to be that um, treble height sleeper to allow them to actually be at the same heights as. Um, panel three, five, um, ten, and eight. When it came to allowing traffic to move across the hole that had been um, created because of the old hole being removed. So there's one of the slate panels in place. It's just showing you really why it was actually needed, and why it was actually that height. So it just means that the um, the rails on the actual panel going out of the layout met with the same height as the, the, the panels that were actually in the whole where the, the whole um, new FFU layout was going to be installed. So listing the new crossings was obviously a, a needed to be planned quite considerably um, in terms of uh, what was needed to move what and how. Um, and the changes, as you'll see, when it came to the actual lift itself, the changes in the centre of gravity caused quite a few um, Lump in the throat moments when it came to the the lift itself, as we'll look up and see on some of the photographs. So effectively, the build area there on the top was where the layout was rebuilt after um, Progress Road had delivered it to site through um, using the rail trains to actually get there. And then the position then would move with both Kirov cranes lifting it in tandem to get it aligned with the actual East Coast Main Line. And then it needed to actually be placed just north of the um, New York Lincoln line as a sort of a holding area, while one of the slave panels was taken out that allowed the blue Kirov to travel over the, the hole in the, in the actual um, ground that was there. So that was the reason why that was actually um, the holding station that was needed for a short time before they put it into uh, the layout into track in this position. So to actually look at creating the actual build site, um, there was quite a lot of preparation work needed to actually get the site in a state that the actual layout could be rebuilt on site. So this is, as I said, that's the area where it was rebuilt. Um, and clearly you can see there's a massive amount of ballast to be delivered to actually create the right height. So as you see on the top left there, that is, um, where that photograph was taken from is the level of the, the um, access point to the site, which had been sold off by our commercial people to um, some travellers that were actually now living in that area. So the restriction was obviously another thing that was needed to be um, gained through negotiations with that gentleman. So he obviously um, came out quite um, well from that um, requirement. Um, but clearly getting a vehicle up that slope was quite a key a key problem but um, that's the slope that was there uh, during the renewal and that's how it looked during that time so quite a lot of work put out slave rails on the bottom left there put in place to allow the, um, the bearers to be um, rebuilt on there um, so yeah this is reinstated after the work had been completed to reduce that height of that um, that ballast pile there to make it a bit more um, user friendly for maintenance in future so yeah, obviously, as you can see there, an awful lot of work went into actually preparing the site so the, um, the layout could be rebuilt um, on a flat level area, which was just adjacent to the, the uh, old layout as it was in track. So this is just showing how the um, panels were dismantled, obviously, from Ilkeston, take by truck to Beeston, put on the actual tilted wagons and then delivered to site and then reassembled using Kirov cranes again. And then clearly later on, obviously, the ironwork needs to go back on again and just recreate the actual whole layout to actually um, make it into the finally fully fitted assembly. The bolts are actually put in there to fasten the joint, each joint together. So one of the problems we had with um, product acceptance was that IP were quite 
engineering wise, they were quite keen to make sure that the iron product acceptance certificate was in place for this layout before it was actually installed, which is clearly what normally happens. But um, I talked to Steve Varley, who I think is on this uh, call at the moment, who's listening in, to say basically we're not going to actually be able to produce a PA certificate because until two weeks beforehand because until we are able to put these bearers together on site I'm not going to be able to sign off the joints are actually um, correct and they're bolted correctly and everything's fitted up and I've got no risks that I'm a bit concerned about before it goes on track. IP were a, um, a bigger organisation looking at the actual risks for this were not really happy that that was the situation, so they were getting a little bit excited that the product acceptance certificate hadn't been um, received probably three or four weeks um, ahead of the two weeks I, I'd actually stated. But unfortunately, there was no way this was going to happen because the build wasn't actually going to be on site until uh, around about the third week before the installation to, to get that actually confirmed. So there was a bit of a problem with, with IP wanting to actually get that assessed and making sure that there was no risk that the layout wouldn't be ready. But obviously I, I couldn't actually give that guarantee because there was a requirement for me to make sure that those joints were actually um, as built as required and they were uh, in the right um, format and there was no problems with them. So it, it was a bit of a, a friction moment between IP and, and ourselves. So there's the layout actually as it's finished. Um, looks uh, quite impressive. <clears throat> the one thing I will say when uh, I went to a site to have a look at this once it completed, Kev King who was the um, um, lead, team leader from Progress Rail who built the layout, he said to me that he'd been looking at the layout itself and I ended up with the current layout that was installed as you can see in the top right hand side of the picture and he said well Phil I don't think this is actually gonna, it's not the right angle, I don't, I'm quite happy it's gonna work. So it's one of those heart in mouth moments thinking, just a minute, you put the crossings on there, the crossings are exactly the same as the casting that you've had up in the, that are currently stored in the track now. The angles are exactly right, therefore the actual bearers that we've built are the right angles, so it'll fit, don't worry. Well, obviously, time told and it did fit, so thankfully for what, a little bit of a doubt with that going in your mind when people ask you those questions. So this is where we obviously look at the layout introduction installation. Um, it was over a three-day blockade in August, over August Bank holiday. It just happened to be the hottest days of the summer. I think actually on the day when it was installed, I think it got to mid-30s in terms of temperature. So quite difficult conditions um, for everybody that was doing the work to work in. And obviously um, they did a great job in the, those circumstances. So this is a few photos really of just some of the layout being taken out. So quite difficult in terms of the amount of, of um, problems that were, were um, overcome. The ballast was ballast glued in a previous layout introduction in 2003. So that had to be sorted out, getting access to the actual beams, then cutting them up so they could take them up in sections and then clearly um, getting over the suction of the, the uh, into me intervening 15 years of traffic going over the top of the layout and compacting all the ballast together to actually uh, make it more difficult for lifting the actual um, old bearers out of um, the layout. But clearly this is green heart timber, remember, and it's a very, very hard timber. So cutting those slots in that that guy's looking at doing in the center wasn't necessarily the easiest thing to do because this, um, this timber is uh, very, very dense and difficult to work with. So this is just showing some of the GSL being installed on the uh, run in and run out of the, the um, hole where the actual um, layout would be installed. Similar sort of situation where it was put through uh, onto the layout itself in um, the area where the FFU was going to sit. Again, a few more photos showing uh, the preparation. And this is where it actually got a bit interesting. Um, the layout obviously needed to be built um, and then obviously lifted by two kilo cranes. So when they actually took it off the ground initially, where they've strapped it in two places, we were a little bit concerned again in SD as far as, well, if you're just using two lifting points, what stresses are we putting in this layout, this actual, these, the bearer matrix? So the bearer is going to be able to withstand this stress. And what bending moments are we going to impart in this and, and whether we actually have um, the right factor of safety to mean that we've got some leeway to be confident that these bearers aren't going to be damaged due to lifting. 
So we did a lot of calculations, um, basically looking at the bears themselves and without factoring in the actual stiffer section on the top when the crossings were installed. Um, and we got to a point where the factor safety was around about three and a half to four. So that gave us a bit of comfort that the, the bearer matrix could withstand a few um, streaks, stresses and strains um, through the two lifting points we've got here. But as you can see, once they actually lifted, the two kilowatt cranes lifted the layout out up in the first place, it was nice and level. They then actually started to jib the, the crane cranes into the center line of the, the track to take it up the track past the, uh, the hole where it's going to be installed. And because the center of gravity changed, you can see it took on quite a bit of a list. Uh, it's one of those moments where you could hear the, the layout creaking and tilting even further. And it was just a, a bit of a worrying time to actually see that happening as the, uh, the layout was being moved. But luckily, we inspected it after it had been put down in the holding area um, just north of the New York Lincoln line. Everything was fine, so there was no damage to power and everything seemed to be um, ideally um, strong enough to, to take these strains. But it was one of those moments you're thinking, oh my word, <laughs> hopefully, if we damage this, we're in real trouble. So then the layout actually um, got in, uh, installed into position, took quite a little bit of um, maneuvering to try and get um, the right pullet position because I think we're talking about moving at. Um, around about 12 millimeters at one point to try and get a Kirov crane to give you that um, that flexibility it was a bit of a, a tall order, but um, we got it in place. Um, the, the renewal guys got it set down exactly where it needed to be and compared to where the old layout was. Um, the alignment was uh, as much as, as good as possible. So as you can see the uh, um, cranes did quite a good job considering the, uh, the difficulty they had with the, the center of gravity. Another picture is just showing the layout once it's actually been um, laid down. Again, just a bit more construction um, photographs. So you can see actually you know, how it joins up with the at least one of the panels going on the uh, line to um, Doncaster. And then obviously then reinstalling the, uh, the, slay, the um, transition panels. And the ballasting, and obviously the using tampers to actually allow that to, to be compacted as much as possible. And there we are, the finished item, more or less, apart from um, the speed that was put on. So, in other words, there was obviously a, quite a bit of question mark about what type of um, settlement we're going to get, how much that would need uh, following up work to try and make sure that we actually uh, tighten everything up where some settlement occurred, etc. So. It happened with the 50 mile, TS, 50 mile hour TSR um, for a week um, and then went back in to look at assessing that to see what settlement had occurred during that first week. Um, uh, obviously, there was a bit of an issue um, that eased the TSR up to 80 miles an hour after the weekend um, follow up in terms of looking at doing some bit of grind, grinding because the crossings themselves weren't actually EDH'd. Um, and the the uh, robot hand tamping did quite a great job of actually filling a lot of voids that had developed during that first week under the crossing where things were starting moving around with the bearers. So that actually made a big difference to the, um, the quality of the track, uh, track geometry as the uh, layout was um, a week old. But one thing I didn't mention, and we haven't actually got slide in here at the minute, the reason why we didn't do um, EDH crossings. The EDH itself was was specified, so that was something we expected Progress Rail would do on the crossings as they produced them. But what we didn't realise was one of the problems they found after the first two castings were EDH'd. They'd um, developed some cracks, some very fine cracks on the actual nose of one of the uh, noses on the double stars on two of the castings. So the first two castings they did were basically destroyed because they weren't actually fit for purpose due to these cracks that had occurred. The reason why we actually decided and went for a non-EDH was that the speed that they could actually look at how, um, where these cracks were coming from and why they were occurring would mean that they weren't able to meet the lead time to actually allow us to produce all eight crossings. So we had to actually look at a compromise because if they carried on EDHing the crossings each time there was a possibility that we'd still get the cracks again appearing on the actual nose 
and obviously that would mean that we'd uh, just reject that crossing itself so we're back to square one again so to avoid any issues that may put that at risk that, so the supply of the crossing won't actually get a lead, lead time needed we later we basically agreed to actually have them supplied as non-EDH um, so in the meantime, Progress Road were investigating why it was occurring, what the problems were, and we've resolved all that since the renewal. Basically, a lot of small incremental changes on the casting process and the, the mould itself that, that seemed to combine to cause a, a problem that caused a, a sort of a pocket to um, be um, evident in the casting itself. But the explosive force of the EDH actually had caused cracks to actually go from the nose to this pocket uh, that had um, developed in the actual casting but obviously having non-EDH crossings wasn't really desirable because the new full well that would be quite soft in the first few weeks of the life of the crossing so we go, we're expecting quite a lot of plastic flow and therefore we need to go in there and maintain those crossing noses as soon as possible afterwards to make sure they were uh, ground and rebuilt back up to a, a profile that was um, acceptable to continue without actually putting too much and do stress on the actual crossings uh, as traffic travel over them. So that was something that was done quite quickly after the renewal had been um, open to traffic. So again, first visual inspection on the uh, Monday, the week 24, after the 80 out miles an hour was um, in, introduced. The speed, go back a little bit, it was shown that it was minimal voiding, so the hand tamping had really made a big, big difference to the problems of the, the voiding that was evident after the first week. We've been there back out there a few times after that to look at how that's developing. And then after uh, four weeks of the installation, the um, speed was laid right back to its 100 mile an hour line speed. And the last time I heard it may actually have changed, but the, um, the actual crossing layout was actually in the satisfactory section of the track geometry, which you might think, well, well hold on a second, this is a renewal, it should be in the um, you're good at least. Well, we've looked at all the actual records and the, the actual um, track quality that occurred after each renewal, and this is the highest quality they've actually achieved um, and that's been maintained as far as the actual layout itself is concerned. The problem with the actual track recording of the layout, if you think about a track recording vehicle going over the train, you've got those. Um, four crossing noses within quick succession on each track, each rail, sorry. And each rail is offset by some 44 or 41 degrees. So the wheels are going to get very excited on the track recording train as it go over that layout. So to try and actually see what that means within the actual algorithms of the software for the track recording geometry, it was difficult to try and um, quantify whether it would actually see some problems due to the actual excitation of the, the wheels that went through the, the layout, and that's still the case. Uh, obviously, we're not quite sure whether that actually influences what track geometry um, feedback you get from the train or not. But clearly, the satisfactory compared to it being in the super red um, zone was quite a good result. And there we are with the um, first zoom of going over the layout. I think it's quite a tantamount to the introduction of a new layout and a new train. So thank you very much for listening. There's um, obviously uh, quite a lot of um, people being involved with the build of this layout and the installation of it. Um, clearly, they're all mentioned there. So thank you very much, everyone. So if there are any questions, I'm quite happy to try and answer them. Thank you very much for that, Phil. That's been really fascinating, certainly from my point of view, and I'm sure most people, on, if not everybody on the call would agree. Um, there is a few questions coming through. A couple of people have asked um, if the talk would be available. So that will go up onto the PWI's website and YouTube channel later this week, and I will send an email out to um, section members to let you know where that is. Um, first technical question comes from Steve Featherstone um, and he says brilliant presentation and thanks Phil. Uh, please could you comment on the state of the drainage under and around the crossing and how this is being maintained to allow effective drainage and reduce settlement and ballast damage? I can only comment, I don't know for certain if there's any drainage around there. The reason being is that um, they've obviously anybody who doesn't know the layout around the actual um, Europe flat crossing it's got um, 
the A314, I think it's 314, it's basically Newark Bypass, um, which is on a uh, higher level um, scale, uh, just south of the, um, the layout. To the left, I think then if you're looking from the north, you've got um, the River Trent, and then that crosses over under the actual track to the north on the, on the bridge. So I think, from my understanding, there was no drainage around there, unless Steve Varley knows if he's on the line. There's, there's no track drainage on site, Phil, no. no. I didn't think it was, thanks, Steve. Okay, thank you. Um, I might ask a quick, quick question there, if I might, Phil. Um, from my point of view, I'd, I'd just be interested to know, um, is there any future applications that, that you see FFU being useful for within within track? Well, at the moment we've we've gone through a tender process, I think it's nearly complete now, for introducing FFU as uh, sorry, not FFU, but composites um, sleepers. So FFU itself, we're using that as um blanching of bridge beams. That's going to be something that's taking forward, I think, um, contracts of basically um very soon exchanging between Secure and ourselves. But for this sort of layout, I think it's obviously an area where we were looking for a, a product that's going to give us quite a lot of um, benefits. And in terms of what the actual lifespan of the FFU is at the moment, we're potentially expecting something 30, 40 years in terms of life. The reason being they can't give, Secure we can't give a definite life yet because FFU has only been installed in Japan since about 1980, maybe late 80s, and they keep going back to that particular site and assessing what um, the performance of the FFU is every five to ten years. And at the moment, I think they've, they've only um, been back probably in the last few years to that site again, give it another 10 year life in terms of what they see the performance as. And that will take it up to about 40 years, I think, in 10 years' time. But in that, in, in terms of what we can use FFU in the future for in track terms, I think it's basically um, an open question because we obviously needed this to be a bespoke layout, which is designed particularly for uh, Newark. But clearly, that demonstrates then that it's got the flexibility to be used in various different possible um, um, requirements. So yeah, there's, there's a possibility, even though with I think this has been applied at on track for longitude bridge beams to look at any other potential requirements that FFU could help with. Okay, um, a few more questions then. So the next one's from Easy Lane, um, who says, really interesting presentation. Would FFU have been accepted if it was possible to source the timber? I think it would have done because the if you look at the actual time scale between each of the renewals that have occurred previously, it's always been around about 15 to 20 years, and clearly it's very destructive to renew new workers that are layout, um, and anything that can give us a better performance without actually being a problem that may mean that the timber would degrade and we'd need to get to the same position again in, in 15, 20 years' time, depending on how the performance occurred. Then yes, and the other thing is, I think um, the problem with green heart timber, which is something we were trying to potentially look at in the first place, it's not FSC um, certified anymore. Therefore, we couldn't actually uh, obtain it through its services. It's against their policy. So there's a couple of areas where it was considered to go for something a bit more um, sustainable, and could argue whether it's whether you think it's our environment friendly or not because of the way the, the FFU is manufactured and made in terms of the sort of carbon footprint, that type of thing. But um, it's obviously got more benefits than, than just going back to the same um, green heart timber. Okay. Um, and another question from uh, Steve Featherson this time. Have we left some spare crossings and other parts in the cess? Should they be required by the maintainer? All the crossings were saved that were actually installed in 2015. So I'm not sure if there's any that are left in the sense. I think the agreement was really for taking them to Whitemore to get them refurbished if possible and storage because obviously there's they're quite large castings. Um, but I think the maintainers got probably at least a couple to use. And they were actually ordering a, a new spare that um, was going to be EDH'd with the new foot um, crossing. So the only problem with the new crossings in terms of 
sorry, the L crossings and using them in future is that the foot design is slightly different. It can still be used, but clearly there's got to be some um, recognition for maintenance that they need to actually use a different component. So they still need the um, top hat ferrule that's eccentric that um, we took out for the, the recent renewal design. So there's a lot, slight difference, but yes, the crossings have all been saved. The other um, panels, I think they've all been scrapped because there wasn't anything that was similar in terms of what we actually have uh, modified. So some of the check rail um, base plates, for example, they're bespoke more up to date with um, uh, NNR 56V design. Um, and some of the, the actual screw fasteners are slightly different. And with, basically the reason why we actually used the UCV um, check base plate was A, it's a, a newer design and it's um, using uh, stronger cast iron, but we actually increased the height of the boss so we could actually make sure we um, use exactly the same fastener all the way through. So the screw length throughout the panel was uh, the same. Um, and that was another improvement that was actually not um, possible with the old layout. So the screws in the transition panels going off the um, FFU uh, for the timber bears as they were, were a different length to the ones that are actually fastening the crossings. So again, there's slight, slight incremental change there. Okay, thank you. Um, I know we were scheduled to finish at two, so um, th there is a few more questions, but are you happy to just do five more minutes or, or are you rushing to get off to anything else, Phil? Oh, I'm fine for the next few minutes. Okay, we'll, we'll do five minutes more questions and, and then we'll call it to a close there. So the, the next question's from um, Paul Ebert, who says, really interested in presentation and thanks, Phil. Can you advise what the anticipated life of the new assembly is? Well, the actual, the crossings themselves will probably need replacing at some point in midlife, if you like, like we've done with the, the 2015 change that we did with those. But the actual FFU bearers potentially and this is obviously just a, an estimate at the minute, 40 to 50 years. It might be a case where the actual ballast might be needing replacing in underneath the bearers before the, the actual bearers need replacing. So theoretically, we might just take out the layout, change the cut things, or keep the bearers and replace the ballast. If it makes more time in these way. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Next question is from um, David Chubb, um, and he asks, what extra safety precautions are required during construction and during maintenance with, when deal, dealing with FFU over timber? There are a few, obviously. If you're using um, any machinery, so drilling or sawing of FFU, if you needed to, the only thing that we probably could, would need to do is perhaps re-drill to um, refix some screws perhaps in future but there's obviously there's similarities between FFU how it performs in in terms of being workable and timber but you get fumes obviously from the actual FFU you'll get dust so on the MSDF sheet which are all being supplied to maintenance um, in a novel infrastructure asset maintenance plan which has been put together by the, the local area it's got all that information about wearing the right PPE, so face masks, gloves, etc., and avoiding um, being in contact with, uh, with the actual material, with bare skin, etc. So there's, there's a few precautions, but there's not that much problem with actual working the, the actual FFU itself in terms of anything over and above what we'd expect. So obviously using gloves and a face mask and goals, they're the main areas of uh, PPE that are needed to actually do any work on this. So just going across slightly, it's a different tangent. If we needed to replace a, um, a screw because the screw hole got elongated um, and it was needed to be repaired, there is a repair process for the screw holes. So you can fill it with a particular two-pack um, resin material, then redrill your um, hole through the screw and then put your screw back in again. So anybody who's used spike fast in the past that's a similar sort of situation with, with how this works. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question from Tony Morgani. Um, appreciating that it's fairly early into the life of the asset, but given the previous early deterioration into poor and very poor track quality, has there been any indication as to how the new assembly is likely to measure against that? Well, I think the estimation was obviously done through the trackbed investigation. So the, the actual trackbed itself was the, the bigger problem. Um, the SFU itself was obviously a bit of an unknown entry in terms of using it for this type of uh, layout. But that was all in part of the trackbed investigation as to how the FFU would perform. So the FFU uh, criteria and the forms of material was supplied to the TBI team to factor that into the overall layout performance. Uh, and the graphs that are earlier on in the presentation illustrate what our estimations are, uh, of how much settlement would, would occur uh, if it was just uh, ordinary FFU on its own, or as we've actually put in place FFU with under bearer pads installed as well. So that increases the, the performance of the, um, the whole layout system, so it avoids the settlement that we've got a problem with. Because basically, the old layout was in a hole. Because all the ballast had degraded so much, it sank down, so it was a bit of a hollow that the the, um, the layout was causing more track geometry problems because the ballast was shot. But obviously, it's going to be something we'll keep an eye on as, as the uh, age of the layout increases. Okay. Hey, um, and if we ask a, a final question, because I'm just conscious of time, uh, this one's from Andy P, and he asks, Hi Phil, a great talk. Um, can you say anything about the recyclability of FFU when it is life expired and in terms of the use in track? Yes, yeah, Sekisui have got a, a process in place to take the old, old FFU and get it recycled. There is a, a process that they would use in Japan itself, but they've obviously given us the information to do that over here to um, allow us to actually, it, it, it's a bit high level, but you've got to have a, a suitable contractor where actually can take the material and then obviously dispose of it in the correct way. So there is, there is a process in place for that. Okay, brilliant. Um, so just to just to finish off then, thank you for from me and from from the section in terms of um, coming and, and speaking for us today. Uh, I think we got up to about 110 people on the call at one at the, at the sort of peak. So it's been a really good attendance, and it's it's really lovely that we can get to to share this with everybody. Um, so yeah, just thank you from me, uh, and I hope everybody stays safe and um, has a good rest of their day and week. Thank you very much. Thank you.